we're going to do another method of meditation this morning, a guided meditation. And many of you have already done it, the sleeping, and some of you have not. For those of you who have done it, it's a nice reminder. For those of you who have not done it before, it may be a very valuable addition, particularly if it's difficult to concentrate on the breath. This may be helpful. In essence, concentration is concentration, but on the other hand, if the mind has something more to focus on, it often does work better. We will first do it, and then I'll explain its purpose and benefits. The only thing that we need to know, those of you who haven't done it before, beforehand, is the expression top of the head and crown of the head. Top of the head depicts the um, spot on the um, on the top here, which is usually uh, manifested with a very small, um, hardly noticeable indentation. And it can be three or four fingers in from the hairline. In a baby, it's a spot that grows together later. It's a soft spot. We often call it the soft spot, but in a grown-up it often manifests as a small indentation, about three or four fingers in from the hairline. That's called the top of the head. And the crown of the head is in the back where the hair whirls. Now some people have it on the left, some on the right, some in the middle, and some even have two. That doesn't matter, you just pick one. <laughs> That's only a direction finder, that you know where you're going. Most people have one on one side, either left or right, where the hair has sort of a, looks or feels like a world. The other things I'm going to say are going to be self-evident, just these two. And we'll discuss what the um, essence of this method is after we've done it, because then it is easily apparent. Naturally, it also requires that you stay with it. If you don't stay with it, what will happen is that you may lose half of it on the way and then not quite know what to do and where to go. So if the mind strays, notice it and bring it back. And if the mind rebels, notice it and bring it back. Name it, label it and bring it back. We can be in charge of what we're thinking when we make that effort. In order to start, we put the attention on the breath, on the sensation that arises when the wind of the breath hits the nostrils. We'll do that for a few moments. There's a sensation at the nostrils. Try to become aware of that and we'll do it a few moments.
Now we'll transfer our full attention to the top of the head. We let the breath go completely. We're just breathing without any attention on that fact. The top of the head, an area the size of a large coin. That's where our full attention goes. And we become aware of any sensation that arises there. It may be pressure, maybe warmth, touch, it may be expansion or contraction, pleasant or unpleasant, hard or soft, it may be moving or still, maybe stabbing, any sensation at all, it doesn't matter what kind, it only matters that we are aware of the sensation. It may be outward, on the top of the skin, inward, going as far in as we can, that too doesn't matter. The awareness is all that matters. And then we slowly go along the top of the skull, moving from one spot to the next, becoming aware of sensation in each spot, letting go and going to the next spot. The size of the spot is arbitrary, whatever feels most appropriate to you, larger or smaller, whichever way, on the surface of the skin or further in, whatever seems easier to fathom. It's the awareness that counts. Knowing it, letting go, moving on. Hardness, softness, pleasant, poking, stabbing, contracting, expanding, warm, cool, touch, any of these or any other. You don't have to name them. You can if you wish. I'm only naming them to help. We move our mindfulness, our full attention, to the crown of the head. And that's the only spot that we are attentive to. And we try to become aware of it from the inside, not standing outside as an observer, but being in it. And as we are in it, we feel whatever sensation there is. We slowly move from the crown of the head down the back of the head to where the neck joins, spot after spot. Size of the spot is immaterial whichever feels most appropriate to you. The awareness of sensation is what counts. Knowing it, letting go of it, moving to the next spot. 
heaviness, lightness, movement, stillness, tingling, tickling, poking, stabbing, pressure, any of these or any other. We move our full attention to the left side of the head, coming down from the skull to the jawline, from the hairline in front to behind the left ear, noticing each spot, each sensation, letting go and moving on. If there is no sensation in a certain spot, stay a moment longer and then move on. Make sure that you stay with the area that we are concerned with and let everything else go. Hardness, softness, touch, sensation, anything that you notice. And we change our attention to the right side of the head, slowly moving down from the top of the skull to the jawline, from the hairline in front to behind the right ear. We put our attention on the hairline above the forehead and slowly move down to the eyebrows, the full width of the forehead. And notice whatever we can. Pressure, heaviness, expansion, warmth, movement, stillness, Contraction, and we put our full attention on the left eye, socket, eyeball, lid, and we notice touch. Warmth, moist, movement, dark. And we transfer the attention to the right eye, socket, eyeball, lid, and notice pressure, touching, lightness, heavy, moist, any of these or any other. It's the noticing that counts, not the kind of sensation. And we put our attention on the top of the nose between the eyebrows and slowly move down the nose to its tip. 
and in each spot we become aware how it feels hard, soft tingly, tickly heavy whatever it may be and we put our attention on the tip of the nose and move slowly inward up the nose and there we can become aware of moisture or dryness of touch of pleasantness or unpleasantness of space or fullness whatever is applicable whatever you notice these are only suggestions that may be noticeable. And we put the attention on the small area between the tip of the nose and the upper lip. And feel warmth, touch, tingle, pressure, anything at all, noticing is the key. And we put our attention on upper and lower lip and become aware of the touch sensation, of the warmth, of the moisture, of contraction or expansion, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, soft or hard, or anything else. And we put our attention on the inside of the mouth and go from spot to spot and notice wet, dry, space, full, touch, hard, soft, And we put our attention on the chin, slowly moving down from the lower lip, noticing each spot, letting go, going to the next one. And we'll go to the left cheek, slowly moving down from the eye to the jawline, touching upon each spot. Being on the inside of the spot and not outside as an observer, but inside as the experiencer, knowing what I feel like. And we transfer the attention to the right cheek, slowly moving down from the eye to the jawline. 
spot after spot. Make the spot the size you find most appropriate. Be inside of it. Notice, become aware, let go, go to the next spot. Put the attention on the throat, slowly moving down from the jawline to where it joins the body, the trunk. Noticing touch or warmth on the outside or space of fullness inside, obstruction, heaviness, these are only suggestions, what you notice, that is what comes. put the attention at the back of the neck, slowly moving down from the back of the head, down the back of the neck, to where it joins the trunk. Each spot may be having the same or different sensations. That too doesn't matter. Maybe tense, relaxed, unpleasant, poking, stabbing, pleasant, warm, We'll put our attention on the left shoulder, slowly moving from the throat to where the left arm joins, top of the shoulder, spot after spot. We may feel heaviness, sorrow, rejection, dislike, anger, tension, relaxed, touch, warmth, whatever it may be, know it, let go, go to the next spot, be inside each spot, not outside looking at it. Don't make any inquiries 
why you are feeling what you are feeling. Be aware of the feeling, let it go and go on. Put our full attention on the left upper arm, slowly moving down from the shoulder to the elbow, all around the left upper arm. Be in each spot. Know it from inside out. Let it go. Go to the next one. It may be a physical sensation or it can be emotional feeling. Either way. Notice, let go, go on. If any other part of the body is clamoring for attention, let it go. Go back to where we're at. Now put your full attention on the left elbow, a small area. Let everything else go. Just be there, inside of it, and notice what it feels like. Moving, still, electric, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, warm, cool, touching, hard, soft, any one of these or any other. Put your full attention on the left lower arm, slowly coming down from the left elbow to the wrist. All around the left lower arm, becoming aware more and more of what the sensations, the feelings are like. A body that's alive has sensations everywhere. Some are stronger, some are weaker. Now put your full attention on the left wrist all around. Feel it. Movement, stillness. Heavy, light, touch. Contraction, expansion, poking, stabbing, and put your attention on the left hand.
the upper part and slowly move from the wrist to where the fingers join. Be inside each spot. Do you notice the sensation? Now put your attention on the palm of the left hand, slowly moving from the wrist to where the fingers join. And put your attention at the bottom of the five fingers on the left hand. Slowly move along the fingers to their tips. Put your full attention on the five fingertips of the left hand. And make a mind movement out from the fingertips out into the room. Now put your attention on the right shoulder, slowly moving from the throat, the neck, along the top of the shoulder to where the right arm joins. Become aware of any feeling, sensation, or emotion. Know it, drop it, go on. Heaviness, lightness, tension, relaxed. Contraction, expansion, sadness, rejection, fear, worry. Happiness delight, anything at all, just know it, drop it, go on. Put your full attention on the right upper arm, slowly moving down from the shoulder to the elbow, all around the right upper arm. Be inside each spot, become aware of the feeling. Let all other spots of the body go that might be clamoring for attention. And just ask, what am I feeling in the particular spot that I'm at, at the right upper arm? Now put your full attention on the right elbow. A small area let everything else go. Be only there. Be inside of it and know it. Know the sensation.
Now put your full attention on the right lower arm, slowly moving down from the elbow to the wrist. all around the right lower arm getting to know your own sensations your own feelings as they manifest in the body Put your attention on the right wrist, all around. And know what can be felt there. Can you feel movement, or touch, or warmth? Now put your attention on the back of the right hand, slowly moving from the wrist to where the fingers join. Now put your attention on the palm of the right hand, slowly moving from the wrist to where the fingers join. Know it from inside out. Put your attention at the bottom of the five fingers of the right hand. Slowly move along the fingers to their tips. Put your full attention on the five tips. And make a mind movement out. Out into the room. Now put your full attention on the front of the trunk, the left side, starting at the left shoulder, slowly move down to the waist, spot after spot. Recognizing sensation and or feeling, which would be emotion. There can be blockages, heaviness, obstructions, openness, warmth, lovingness, happiness, sadness, dislike, rejection, touch, warmth, soft, hard, anything at all. Notice it, drop it, go on. Be on the inside, noticing it, not on the outside, observing.
And now go to the right side of the front of the trunk, slowly moving down from the right shoulder to the waist. Touching with mindfulness each spot, recognizing sensation or feeling, letting go and going to the next spot. Becoming fully aware of what one feels like. Now put the full attention on the waistline in front. Going from spot to spot. Touch, warmth, loose, tight, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. and slowly move down from the waist down the lower part of the front of the trunk to where the legs join touching upon each spot recognizing the feeling letting go going to the next one transfer our attention to the back, the left side of the back, starting at the left shoulder, slowly moving down with our mindfulness to touch upon each spot on the left side of the back as far as the waist. Hard, soft, tense, relaxed, Touch, warmth, moving, stillness, poking, stabbing. If there's one particular spot that keeps asking for attention, let go and go to the next one. And we move our attention to the right side of the back, slowly moving down from the shoulder to the waist, getting to know what we feel like.
If the mind becomes distracted, gently but determinedly bring it back to the right side of the back and keep going. If there's resistance, dislike, notice it. Know it, drop it, go to the next spot. Go from spot to spot and know what it feels like. And then put your attention on the left lower back, starting at the waist. Slowly moving down to the seat to where the left leg joins. Pressure, touch, heaviness, poking, numb, anything at all. Be with your own sensation. Now transfer your attention to the right lower back, starting at the waist slowly moving down to the seat to where the right leg joins. Know each sensation, let it go, go to the next spot. Some of the sensations are stronger, some are weaker. They are all sensations. Now put your full attention on the left thigh. Slowly moving down from the trunk to the knee the whole left thigh, all around. Spot after spot. Know it, pleasant, unpleasant. Touching, heavy, warm, cool, soft, hard. And now put your full attention on the left knee, all around, outside and inside. Go from spot to spot and notice. There's nothing to dislike or like as only noticing and dropping and going to the next spot. And now we'll put our full attention on the left lower leg, starting from the knee going down to the ankle, all around.
now put the full attention on the left ankle. Let everything else go, just be there, inside of it, knowing what it feels like. Hard touch, stabbing, poking, And then put your attention on the left heel. Be inside of it and know it. Put your full attention on the sole of the left foot, slowly going from the heel to where the toes join. Spot after spot, tingling, tickling, squashed, touched, heavy. And put your full attention on the top of the left foot, slowly moving from the ankle to where the toes join. What do I feel there? Put your full attention at the bottom of the five toes of the left foot. Slowly move along the toes to their tips. Put your full attention on the five tips and make a mind movement out, out into the room. Now put your full attention on the right thigh, starting where it joins the trunk, slowly moving down to the knee. all around the right thigh. What are the sensations? Know them, drop them, go to the next spot. Now put your full attention on the right knee all around, outside and inside, know each spot, no liking, no disliking, just knowing. Now put your full attention on the lower right leg, slowly moving down from the knee to the ankle, all around. What do I feel in each spot? What is it like? If you don't feel sensation, wait a moment longer and then move on. There are sensations everywhere, but sometimes not immediately available. As long as the body is alive, there is pulsing going all through the body. Put your attention on the right ankle. Can you become aware of the pulsing?
or any other sensation. Put your full attention on the right heel, small area, let everything else go. What's it feel like? And then put your full attention on the sole of the right foot, starting at the heel, slowly moving along to where the toes join. Now put your attention on the top of the right foot, starting at the ankle, slowly moving to where the toes join. And put your full attention at the bottom of the five toes of the right foot. Slowly move along the toes to their tips. Put your attention on the five tips. And make a mind movement out, from the toes out into the room. I'm going to explain some of the features of this method and also preempt some of the ever recurring questions. <laughs> so we're going to have less pieces of paper. But not for that reason, no. Uh, so that you can get on with it. First of all, I would like those of you who have done this for the first time or those of you who have done it in the past but have forgotten what it was like to do that immediately after lunch in the first meditation session when it's still fresh in your mind what you're supposed to be doing. If you continue doing it, you can of course get a tape to take home and in the beginning follow the tape. There's no problem with that. After a short while, it's a matter of course what one does. So please, for those of you who, for whom it's new, new, do it right away after lunch so that you can get a little more familiar with it. For those of you for whom it's old and you've forgotten, do it too. For those of you who didn't like doing it, be sure to do it. <laughs> It's an absolute essential must because there's a reason for not liking to do it. It's much more difficult in this method for the mind to go hopping all over the world. It's much more difficult to become drowsy and have an idea that it was quite a pleasant meditation because one didn't really have to pay attention. And therefore, very often, not liked. But there's another reason for not liking it. One gets very near to oneself. 
very near. And if one hasn't practiced that in the past, it may appear to be unpleasant. There's nothing unpleasant about it. It's just getting near to oneself. We don't have to make judgments. Totally unnecessary. You see, mindfulness means knowing only. No judgment, nothing. It's neither nice nor not nice. It's either likable or not likable. It has nothing to do with it. It's knowing only. And therefore, in this particular method, you have an opportunity to stand within you or next to you or watching yourself as an object instead of a subject. And that, one of these days, will have to become one's reality. <coughs> as long as we watch ourselves as a subject, the me stands out up top, on, in front. As an object, <coughs> well, so what? It's just happening. So if you didn't like it, be sure to do it. And you can also inquire. Why didn't I like it? And then your answer is a new question. Can very much um, be uh, of help to know oneself better. The first question that arises for those of you who've done it for the first time is that you may not have felt anything at the top of the head and the first thing you felt was the lids of the eyes um, being on the eyes, well, quite possible, or the lips or whatever. If that's the case, if you haven't felt anything at the top of the head, but it's only later somewhere, you start at that point where you felt something and go up to the top of the head five or six times. And as you go up to the top of the head, you go out of the top of the head from here and go out. And if you've done that five or six times, you start at the top of the head and everything will be most likely available for your notice. Be sure that to know and to practice that it, in this method, watching the breath has no part. When we sit here and talk about the Dhamma, or when we do walking meditation, the breath is a matter of course. If we didn't have it, we'd be dead. But it's not our meditation subject. Some people are often disturbed by the fact that they can't let go of watching the breath. Here we have a totally different meditation um, method. This one is the second foundation of mindfulness. Now if you remember, I think you probably do, that the first foundation is the body, the breath and the walking. And the fourth foundation is a content of the thought which you're supposed to label. You're supposed to label it if it is distracting in meditation and you're supposed to label it in daily life so that you can make unwholesome ones into wholesome ones. Here we've got the second foundation, Vedana Nupasana, the mindfulness of feeling. Method is nothing but method, but essential, essential for practice. Just sitting here and hoping for the best isn't going to do anything. Sitting here and thinking isn't going to do anything. We can sit anywhere and think. We don't have to sit here. But when we have a method which focuses the mind on something specific, we are learning that there is the possibility and the ability within us to be one-pointed. In Pali, that's called ekagata. Eka is one. One-pointed. And what is one-pointedness? We've got to learn it. Otherwise, we can't get anywhere with this practice. One-pointedness is like 
what we might say, sharpening a pencil, where it has a fine point. The Buddha called it honing an axe. If you've ever worked with an axe that was not sharpened, you know that it's almost impossible to split the wood. But if you've worked with a sharpened axe, one can actually go through it almost like butter. <coughs> Honing our mind, sharpening it to the point where we can see through the illusions. They're like butter then, and we see through them, or they might become like a veil. When the mind is not sharp, those illusions are like a brick wall. So one pointedness must eventually arise. And many people know one pointedness even in their daily lives, but haven't actually transferred that knowledge to meditation. I know people who work with computers. Oh, I guess everybody knows people who work with computers. Um, but I know them well, and a few of them. And they're utterly one-pointed at that computer, because otherwise they're going to lose the whole thing. One wrong move, and the thing just disappears, and they've got a year's work lost. People who paint are very one-pointed. They've got to be. I mean, if they're not one-pointed on their painting, they're going to get something, a scribble. Besides, they like it. Well, both of these one-pointednesses transferred to meditation bring wonderful results. There are other, other um, activities that probably have the same one-pointedness, but those two just come to mind because there are also people here that have those two activities, so that's why they come to mind. So we know that one-pointedness, but that has to become even stronger. And if you have already practiced it in daily life, for some reason or other, then it's a little easier. So that is what happens here. Because in this particular method, we have a broader spectrum of attention. It's a little easier to be one-pointed on the meditation subject and not go astray so much. The going astray on the breath is so easy because the breath is always there. We don't have to look for it, it's always there. And having the mind going off on tangents is quite pleasant. I mean, it's sort of dreamy and uh, a bit uh, not quite, we're not quite here, and uh, we probably don't feel the body so much, but we don't know what's going on. It's got to become, the mind has to become honed. So, for those of you for whom the attention on the breath is particularly difficult. You can use this method exclusively. For those of you who are equally unconcentrated on both, you can alternate. You can, for instance, in one session start with this one and finish up with meditation on the breath if there's still time left. We took one hour just now. But that also is because I have to say it and then do it, so it takes longer. You can easily finish in three quarters of an hour, you can even finish in half an hour. Don't do it any less than that because it becomes superficial. So if you like, you can first do this and then on the breath. If your concentration on both is equally difficult, if it's more difficult on the breath, use this one only. If you're doing the meditative absorptions, do this one once a day. 
very often it's found to be a sp a specifically easy or helpful, I should say, in the morning because the mind isn't quite sharp yet and gets sharpened through that. If one does meditative absorptions and the mind isn't sharp, <coughs> the result will be um, mostly useless. It's, uh, the result is drowsiness. So it's, for most people, good to do it early in the morning, once a day, because it's a cleansing method. It has a cleansing aspect. And here where we have sufficient time to do the meditation, there is, it's quite important to use this one also. The cleansing aspect comes from the fact that all our emotions have to manifest in the body. They haven't got anywhere else to go. And as an example, when we're happy, we smile. Emotion, physical reaction. When we're unhappy, we might cry or frown. When we're very angry, we might even get red in the face. When we are tense, the shoulders hunch up. These are only examples. There's no need that we become aware of the connection in the meditation. This is only in order to explain how our emotional life manifests in the body. Now, all these manifestations have anchored in the body. And as we do this particular method, we have a chance of letting go of many of them, even if we're not aware of the emotion, if we're only aware of the sensation. Now, I made a differentiation between the two. Sensation, physical emotion is the feeling part doesn't matter. When we feel the sensation, we are also touching upon the emotion even without knowing it. The letting go, which I said all the time, is the important aspect. We can't continue this method if we don't let go. If we get stuck in one place, well, we are stuck in one place and we can't go any further. So we've got to let go. Now sometimes we find it difficult because one particular place in the body is extremely painful and the mind just can't let go. So it's an exercise in learning to let go. This letting go is a learning aspect of non-reaction. So we feel something we don't have to react. In fact, we can't. We haven't got time to. And there's nothing to react to. It's just a sensation or it's a feeling. If we had more time, like we usually do, we'd sit there and sort out who has caused that feeling. And I'm sure we'd find somebody. We always do. Somebody must have caused this horrible feeling. And if it isn't anybody that's right around us now, it must have been somebody in the past. Like parents or somebody like that. They must have caused it. But here we haven't got time for that. And not only don't we have time, everybody knows when they take a better look at it that the sensation and the feeling has arisen just because it's there and nobody has said a word. There is nobody causing. There is no trigger. There's only that little jack-in-the-box that I showed people yesterday. I don't know if you were still there. That we have all sitting inside and that's just making itself felt. So we are learning very important steps on the way to equanimity. We're learning that reaction is totally unnecessary. Things are the way they are. And not only that, if we take our mind off 
that particular feeling or sensation and go to the next spot, that particular feeling or sensation is no longer there. The next spot is there. And we now know from personal experience, if we pay attention, that we actually only know that where we put our mind. Which I have mentioned, but of course, you know, it gets lost in the shuffle. That's par for the course. So, again, when you experience it yourself, it doesn't get lost anymore. You know it. We only know where we put our mind. Everything else has disappeared. That is part of one-pointedness. The world has disappeared. Our wishes, our desires, our dislikes have disappeared. We are only concerned with what we feel. And as we let go of that, we learn the non-reaction. And as we do this properly, and I have said uh, several times, be inside, not outside looking at it. Often for people who do it for the first time, they stand outside their body, so to say, and try to find that particular place in the body. That's totally unnecessary. And it doesn't work. Because when you are outside of your body, and trying to find a place in the body, you're outside of your feeling and sensation. So if you're inside it, then you can feel and you are actually with yourself. Whether you are exactly in the top of the left arm or not, it doesn't really matter, as long as you're inside. And as we are inside, we have a much better ability to become aware of the feeling aspect of us. And meditation, when it comes together and becomes full concentration, apana samadhi or sama samadhi, is all feeling, every bit of it. It has no longer any intellectual quality, it doesn't have anything to do with recognizing that it's this way or that way. It is feeling. And our whole life is based on feeling. That's not to say that we don't need the mind to then understand what we have experienced. Wisdom comes from the understood experience, but the experience itself is feeling. What else can be an experience? There is no other kind of experience except feeling. And then understanding it, that's where the mind then goes and says, Aha, I have just experienced that. And that means this. So as we work with this particular method, we have a pathway to become aware of the second base of mindfulness, the mindfulness of sensation and emotion. I'm making a distinction between the two, although in the Buddha's language, there's only one word for it, Vedana, feeling. Yet for us it's helpful if we have in our language two differentiations to use them. Because the more we can differentiate, the easier it is for us to understand. Now another thing which is often um, part of the questioning, first one was, what do I do if I didn't feel anything at the top of the head? I've explained that. Next one is a feeling of slight nausea when you get to the front of the trunk. Excellent. It means that the cleansing process has worked. It usually only happens once. It's nothing to worry about. Some people actually feel as if, you have, as if they have to throw up. Nobody 
in 20 years of teaching has ever done it. But quite a number of people have felt as if, which is fine. Because what we're doing with this cleansing process, and that's why we also let go out of fingertips and out of the tips of the toes, is getting rid of the most noticeable and the most, uh, the strongest residues of heavy emotion. It's like cleaning up a house where we haven't paid any attention to the rubbish. We haven't taken the rubbish out and filled the rubbish cans with it. So if there is nausea, it means that we're taking a whole rubbish can full of stuff and putting it in front to be carted away. In this connection, I'd like to um, say, please, don't look in the rubbish can what's all in there. We don't do that at home either. We don't check out whether there's old banana skins and uh, little uh, yogurt boxes and uh, uh, pieces of uh, um, leftover food or uh, old napkins. And we don't look at that. We just throw it in the rubbish can and let it be carted away. And this is what we do here. We throw it in the rubbish can and it takes, gets taken away. And if there's nausea, that means that we have done at least one full rubbish can. If very often, hardly ever, does that happen twice. It mostly happens the very first time. And it means that one has had good concentration and has come near to one's own feelings. If it happens twice, well, second rubbish can, wonderful. Nothing to worry about. On the contrary, it's a cause for rejoicing. If you do it yourself and you can't quite make it in the allotted time for the meditation, in other words, the bell goes and you're not finished, quickly go from the spot you're at to either out of the fingertips, if they're the nearest, <coughs> or out of the tips of the toes, if they're nearer, whatever's nearest. So have a sort of an ending to it, not just to stop in the middle somewhere. One should always be able to do it in three-quarter hour. If it takes longer, it's tedious, too slow, and the mind has been off on tangents. Or it's a perfectionist mind. It's got to have it absolutely perfect. I've got to know what this feeling is. We don't have to know what this feeling is, not at all. I was only mentioning some of them, the ones that came to mind, just in order to be helpful. We don't have to name them at all. Feeling is feeling and you get on with it. So three quarter hour is plenty. And even half an hour is possible. So if you can't quite make it, get through, uh, go through it quickly to get out of the fingers and toes and then do it a little quicker the next time. We don't, uh, that's another question that happens very often, why don't you use the ears? Well, if we, um, you're welcome to use them. If I went into every little piece that we uh, contain, I would take too long. And. Uh, it would become very tedious. Another thing that I have not particularly um, mentioned is a backbone. That in itself is used as a separate uh, method, but if you wish, when you go through it yourself, you can pay attention to every spot on the backbone and become aware there. It's fine. You can be as inventive as you wish, as long as mindfulness is present. The other thing that we learn, now I've said we learn the non-reaction. We learn very much the one-pointedness. 
because the mind has something more to look at and doesn't have to go off on tangents so much. We also have the personal experience of impermanence. When we realize that as we put our mind on one particular spot and then take it off and go somewhere else, and that particular spot no longer exists for us, we have that experience, that feeling is totally impermanent. (coughs) Now we know already that thinking is impermanent because when we pay attention to the distracting thoughts in the meditation and then label them, in other words, observe them, they disappear. (coughs) The observer is no longer the thinker. So when they disappear, they're gone, aren't they? And yet, we constantly identify with our thoughts, their mind. And they must be right, because I'm thinking them. Is that a good enough reason for our thoughts to be right? That's a very interesting question. The same goes with our feelings. They are constantly disappearing and yet we identify with them, even stronger than with the thoughts. I am feeling this, so that must be the way it is, because I am feeling it. But that, that feeling, disappears in no time at all. We usually don't even notice. Now here we do. And a personal experience of impermanence makes all the difference. In fact, only the personal experience makes all the difference. We can have read as many Buddhist books as we want, and there are so many on the market that one doesn't know anymore what to read. And there isn't a single one, I think, that doesn't uh, mention impermanence. I mean, it's one of the... Um, important aspects of the teaching. But do we live it? That's a big question. Every day that we live, we're getting nearer to the grave. There's no way out. And it's got very little to do with age. Everybody is getting nearer to the grave. So do we live it or do we just look the other way and hope for the best? Most people play the game of like an ostrich putting his head in the sand. We don't want to know about it. We know it, but we don't want to know about it. When we do the method properly and pay attention, and that's what is mindfulness, paying attention, we can't help it. We've got to know it, whether we want to or not. And when we get to know what we maybe don't want to know, eventually it changes our whole attitude towards ourselves and the world around us. And when this attitude towards ourselves and the world around us has changed, to a gentle and accepting flowing with everything that happens. We are no longer hanging on to our own uh, concepts, prejudices, wishes and dislikes. As long as we hang on to those, we're making life difficult for ourselves and others. Because everybody's got different ones. We very rarely meet somebody who's got exactly the same concepts, same prejudices, the same likes and same dislikes. If we should meet somebody like that, we think we've met a soulmate. (laughs) (laughs) Rejoice. It would be much better to rejoice if we meet somebody who says, stop hanging on to that stuff, let go. (laughs) but we don't quite see these things. That's why we need the methods. 
if we haven't got a method of sharpening an axe, how are we going to get it sharp? There's no way we can do it. Or maybe to be more modern, sharpening a chainsaw. Anybody who's ever worked with a chainsaw knows it's got to be done practically every day. This has two. Sharpening the mind has to be done every day. It gets terribly dull because our survival has been made easy for us. In former times, maybe a short time ago or a long time ago, survival was more difficult and the mind was very sharp but only for survival. Now that survival has been made easy compared to what it used to be, instead of using our capacity for sharpness, we allow it, the mind, to be dull. We're going to survive anyway. But when we meditate and meditate properly, we change that automatically.